take your Bible, if you would, to John 15, John chapter 15, and we're going to finish what we started last Sunday evening in John 15 in a series about abiding in the vine, taken from this discourse of Jesus, and really from John, um, well, John 13 is really the Last Supper, from then on to the end of the book of John, is all really the last days of Jesus, uh, John 13, and then 14, 15, 16, 17, uh, and on, is really in between his time of arrest, and then after that is, uh, of course, the arrest, the trials, the crucifixion, and then uh, glory to God, the resurrection. So this is right in the middle of this section that he is giving to his disciples after he, they have partaken in the Last Supper on that uh, evening that they are spending together, and he is making his way now down over the Kidron Valley up into the Garden of Gethsemane, and he is certainly probably walking by some vineyards, some uh, places where uh, farmers are growing fruit and produce, and he is using that imagery. He's, as he's walking by, he's using that fruit as an illustration for what we find here in the first part of John chapter number 15. And so if you're physically able, if you'll stand, if you have John 15, verse number 1, we'll read just the first eight verses here this evening. You follow along, I'll read out loud. John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth fruit, uh, more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches." He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for the opportunity to pray and to ask for your help. We certainly need it. I know that I do. And so, Lord, help me tonight to be clear in what we uh, speak about. To, Lord, help me to uh, put forth what you've placed on my own heart and what you're doing in my own life. I'm grateful for that. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us as a church to work together through these truths and through what you're, you're telling us here uh, in John chapter 15, help us understand that in light of what's going on in your life at the time, the context of this passage, and the Lord help me to make application to us here today. Well, thank you for it. We love you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. So we started last week talking about uh, not just abiding, but verse 2 brings in an interesting uh, aspect of abiding in the vine, and that is the aspect of purging. Oh, no one likes to talk about that. It's never really fun to talk about the disciplinary times or the times when uh, we're brought through a trial or a testing in our life. But as we've been talking about, as Brother Doug's been mentioning in our adult Sunday school class, and as we've talked about in the last couple of weeks here on Sunday evenings about uh, this aspect of purging, it's certainly necessary in our lives. I wish that it was true that I would learn everything just the very first time whenever God uh, gives it to me. I wish that I was good enough Oh, that I was smart enough to get it the first time, like I would read it, and then, now, hold on, I would be obedient to what I've just read, but that's, that's not how I live my life, unfortunately. I wish it was, but it's not. Um, if you are a parent, if you ever were a parent, if you ever had a parent, this has probably been your experience. You ever been told more than one time something you were supposed to do? Uh, yeah, yeah, like, I'm, why do I have to tell you a million times? Well, we exaggerate as parents. We didn't tell them a million times. We might have told them 999,999. <laughs> At least it seems that way. But, well, they're, they're kids. They don't uh, obey right away. I wish they did. And by the way, this is just a little parenting thing that I did when I had told them one time and they ceased to obey the second time. <sighs> that was time for discipline. I told you once. I know. Yeah, I can't believe you would do that. Well... 
my kids aren't here, so I'm just going <laughs> to... But it is true. If you were told, you're expected now to do that. See, I can't expect my kids to do something that I never told them to do. Well, understand, God told me what He wants me to do. And now because He's told me, He expects me to live what He said in this book. And when I don't do those things, when I'm, I'm found knowing those things but not doing those things, then guess who steps in? My Heavenly Father. The husbandman of John 15, verse number 1. And he says, okay, son, there's some areas in your life that need pruning away. There's some uh, parts of your life that uh, need to be uh, worked on and, and bettered. And even in the times when I might be bearing some fruit, and we talked about this a little bit last week, God knows He's the husbandman. He knows when you and I are bearing fruit, but He also knows when my bearing of fruit can be more or more productive or better. And so He prunes away some things even that are good in my life that might hurt, that I, I, Lord, I really like that, but it's not what's best for my life. And the Bible declares that my father, the husbandman, he, he is pruning those things away. And as we read through passages like John 15, I want us to do so through the lens of the cross of Calvary. Think about what Jesus is about to go through here. Think about what he's about to do and, and have done in his, his physical body. And he's telling his disciples here as he's, he's making his way to the garden, full well knowing what's going to happen to him, he is asking them, he's really telling them, what is going to be the, the best help for you is if you will abide close with me. You're going to see me and watch me go through, through some things that you're not going to fully understand. Now, he's told them several times what's going to happen. He's told them he's going to be crucified and go through false trials and how he's going to be buried. But then he's told them several times by John 15 that he's going to rise again the third day. And I've always thought through that passage, why didn't they, why didn't they listen? Why weren't they waiting at the tomb for him to say, man, it's the third day and you, that's what you said. But they weren't. They were wringing their hands and wondering, what are we going to do? The two disciples on the road to Emmaus are, are downtrodden and discouraged because what they thought was true is, is not. And they, they went so far as to listen to, okay, we, we believe He's the, the Savior of the world, that He's the promised Messiah. And, and we believe all that He said and, and we saw all that He did, but... Now that he's gone, we, we don't know what to do. And you remember, we talked about it this morning. As Jesus comes alongside them, what does he do? Oh, fools, and, and slow to hear. Why didn't you listen when I was telling you these things? And once again, he's, he goes back to the very first books of the Bible. Moses, all the prophets, and the Psalms. Well, that pretty well makes up all your Old Testament. And as they're walking that seven miles, what is he doing? He's teaching them once again about himself. Well, what does God do in my life and in your life when, when I need it? By the way, uh, I always need it. There doesn't come a time in my life when I say, well, I've got this. i got it taken care of. Now, I might act like that. That might be my attitude. But I don't have it all together. There are times in my life where uh, I have to kind of make it look like I got it together, but I'm falling apart in the seams on the inside because I'm not abiding in Christ like I ought to be. And that's when Christ says here in, in John 15, listen, son, listen, daughter, abide in me. Draw close to me. When trouble comes, the last thing I ought to do is to run away from God. And yet what do most Christian people do? Well, i got to find out my own way, and i got to make this work because God is, is doing this thing to me. And we start to blame God rather than draw closer to Him. Is it okay for you and for me to tell our Heavenly Father, Lord, I don't understand what you're doing here, but I'm going to follow? Yes, it is. And that's what I should be doing. When I don't get it, when I'm weak, I think I read this somewhere. Oh, yeah, the Bible. When I'm weak, guess what God does? He comes alongside if I'll abide in Him. And He makes me to be strong. Not in my own strength, but in His strength. Because I'm abiding in Him. 
And so we, we mentioned this last week, and we'll just do a, a couple of a moments of review here. If I'm going to get this purging and, and, and kind of have some sense of what it means to abide in the vine, then I've got to understand that I have to receive, first of all, that life-giving water of the Word of God. Psalm 1 and verse number 3. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I draw close. I receive that life-giving word. And then what I do, once I receive it, is I submit my life to it. Because there's a lot of people that receive it. There's a lot of people. We could go out even tonight and say, do you, do you enjoy or appreciate the Bible? Well, yes, I, I like it or I like parts of it or whatever. Different receptions will be different. But you can find a reception for the Bible. The issue is, are you not just receiving it? Are you submitting yourself to it? See, because that's a whole other issue. That's a whole other series of sermons, and that's what we're doing tonight. Is am I submitting myself to what God says in His Word? Jesus likened our hearts to soil. You remember in Matthew chapter 13, there's some hard soil, there's some stony ground, there's some, some, some ground that is just, it's, it's shallow and so the sun comes and it it dries those things away but in Matthew 13 and verse number 23 but he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundred some sixty and some thirty we're going to look at a few verses and while brother Doug was teaching his lesson this morning, I'm over there sweating because I'm like, those are a lot of verses in my sermon tonight. So thank you, brother Doug. Just um, um, gave me some ground to jump off from. But we're going to look some more at those verses tonight and understand you have a choice of how you respond or react when God is working in your life. When, when God is bringing things about in your life, you have the opportunity to either respond uh, in a selfish way and stick a hand out and try to resist those things because you don't understand, you don't like where they're going, or whatever the, the case may be, you can resist those things, or you can come with an accepting, trusting heart and say, Lord, I don't always know, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to submit my will to yours. I'm going to follow in whatever it is you have for my life. Do you think it's true that the more you allow the Word of God, you, the more you allow God working in your life through trials, through good times, through preaching, through teaching, through doing your own time of devotions and Bible study, whatever the case may be, do you think it's true that the more you um, choose to receive those things and submit to them, the more fruit you will bear for the Lord? Yes, yes, that is the correlation. Right? And the more I put into those things, the more I have my heart prepared for those things, the more I, I engage in those things, rather than just reading through and say, well, I'm done for today. Or rather than just reading through a couple of chapters and say, well, I, I fulfill my obligation. Rather than just coming to church on a Sunday or even a Sunday night or a Wednesday night and say, well, I got that obligation out of the way. Why don't we invest in those things and say, I need to get something out of that so that I will bear more fruit for the Lord. There's plenty of people who come on Sunday morning only. There's plenty. There's some who, who even come on Sunday night. There's some who even come on Wednesday night. But are, are we just coming to, to come and to be here because, well, I don't want the preacher to think I'm out doing something or I don't want to get a letter from him because I haven't been out. Or are you coming saying, I want God to invest in my life today. So honestly, regardless of who's standing in this pulpit proclaiming God's word, you are fit, you are decided, I am going to get something out of this. I am going to allow God to do his work in my life rather than just sit there and say, man, when's he going to be done? Man, I got something going on later. Or man, I can't believe, you know, I don't like listening to this guy or this, this sermon or whatever the case may be. Can you have that attitude? Yeah, you can. Have I had that attitude? I hate to say it, but yes, I have. And you know what I got out of it? Nothing. Nothing. I wasted my time. And God has to knock on the door of my heart and say, Son, 
You just wasted a time you could have stewarded, a time I could have spoken to your heart. You just threw out the window because you have a rotten attitude. Because you think you know and you get the word. You're taking it in, but you're not humbling yourself to it. You're not receiving it. You're not doing what it is you should be doing, preparing our heart. And so we looked at John 15 and we said, first of all, purging signifies when God purges in our life, it signifies the providence of God. Verse 1 again, he's the husbandman. I am the true vine, Jesus says, and my father is the husbandman. He's a vine dresser. Everything in my life is orchestrated by him. Is everything in my life pleasant? No. No, but God never promised that. In fact, he did tell me uh, there's going to be some trial and temptation in your life. And when there is, count it all joy. Because I'm doing a work in your life. God is the husbandman. He's the vine dresser. He's the one that has authority. Secondly, he's the one alone that I ought to be giving opportunity to do that in my life. Question. Can you purge some things out of your life uh, without God's help? Yes, yes. There are some things that I can get rid of. I can make the choice, say, I'm not going to do these things anymore. Now, some of the time I can do that if God is speaking to my heart about that, or uh, there are times when God never said that, and I just move and go of my own free will. And I say, well, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't like doing that anymore, whatever. Oftentimes, this comes uh, when people look to get out of ministries. Well, I'm going to purge this out of my life. Oh, really? Is that what God wants you to do? Because I, I don't find that a whole lot of places in Scripture. I do find where Peter went to get out of ministry and said, I go a fishing, and what happened? Jesus showed up and got his heart back toward God rather than toward himself. God alone has the authority to do that in our life. And I would say, the, the more that you reject what the Bible says, the more that you tell God no, the more that you refuse to yield to His will in your life, you are asking for. My dad used to say, you play with the bull, you get the horns. <laughs> play with fire, get burnt, that kind of statement. If you continue to reject God, you continue to, to keep Him at arm's length, all you're doing is you're asking Him to purge things out of your life. Because He loves you enough to say, I'm not going to let you do that. I'm not going to let you stay in that state. So when God prunes, when God cuts things away, He does it for your profit, for your betterment, for your productivity. So that brings us then, secondly, to the fact that purging increases the productivity of God's people. Not only does it, it signify the providence of God in my life, but when God purges, He does so to bring about increase in the productivity of God's people. Look down at verse number 2 of John 15. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So how does God do this? Well, first of all, God purges by removing a, another object of affection. All right? if, if I say, I love God and I also love fill in the blank. Right? Well, God wants me to love him, to serve him. Now, is God against hobbies or, or doing other things? No, he's not against that. What he is against is when I start to leak into his time or I begin to put these other things before I put God in my life. Those other things begin to take my time and my talent and my finances. By the way, all of those things God has given to me to be a good steward of. But when something else is tugging at my heart, when I really say, should I go to church? Should I, I read my Bible? Should I spend time with God? Or should I do this? What do you think God thinks about this? <laughs> well, He wants to purge it away. And every time I pick this, I'm asking Him, I'm calling on Him to purge it out of my life. And the, the harder, the, the more strongly I hold on to this, the more it's going to hurt when He takes it away. God purges by removing the object of affection. Webster defined purging this way, to make free of impurities or to rid of unfriendly elements. 
So God is very concerned about anything in our lives that is unfriendly to Him. That doesn't point our heart back to Him. Anything that, that hinders our fruitfulness as Christians, if there's pride, God wants to purge it. Is there pride in your life? Yes. Shake your little head, yes. Move the marble, yes, yes, yes. And if you didn't shake your head, you are proud. There's pride. He wants to purge it. If there's hurt in your life and you allow that hurt to, to get bundled up and just twist you up in knots and that's all that you can think about is the hurt, guess what? God wants to heal that. If there are burdens, God wants to bear those burdens. God desires for you and for me to bear fruit. He desires for me to live my life for Him. So even in His purging, even as He's taking these things and pruning these things out of my life, He is preparing me for greater blessings and victories. And so God says to Christians who are serious about bearing fruit that He needs to purge anything, anything in their life that is drawing attention, affection away from Him and to these other things, He needs to purge that out of your life. Because he says, son, daughter, you're losing focus on who I want to be in your life. Is God Lord? You better believe that he is. The, the issue is, do I always treat him like that? And if I'm completely honest, there are times when I would, I wouldn't say it out of my mouth, but this is how I live my life. I live like I'm Lord. I do what I'm going to do. I'm going to spend this money. I'm going to go to that place. I'm going to do that thing. Regardless of if God is telling me no or not. And all I'm saying is that, Lord, I'm going to be God this time. I'm going to be the one in charge. And so God says there are times when he has to purge those things away so that you will bear more fruit. By removing the object of affection, God is now able to produce fruit more freely in our life. Well, not only does he remove the object of affection, secondly, God purges by keeping us disciplined to the vine. And if you've ever seen a productive vineyard, just to keep with the grapes analogy, the, the most productive vineyards are those where the vines are watched. And so as they, they, they see the vine and they watch the branches coming off, if there are branches that are broken down or not fully attached back to the vine, well, guess what? That branch isn't going to bear the kind of fruit that the vine dresser wants because it's not getting all the nutrients, all of the, the fuel, the sap, if you will, out of the vine into the branch to feed the fruit that's coming off. And so what a good vine dresser will do is he will watch. He'll watch for disease or something that's keeping the, the vines away. Uh, uh, you've heard the phrase, little foxes spoil the vines. Yeah, well, what's going on? Little, little, little things are getting at those little branches and they're pulling all that away and they're sapping the strength of the vine. Well, what God is saying here in, in John chapter 15 is He is watching when you and I as the branches tend to get away from Him. And what purging does is it brings us back into fellowship, back to be disciplined, if you will, to use that word, with the vine. God intends for us to remain attached to Him during our times of trials and afflictions. You know that some of the most fruitful Christians are those who have stayed faithful through the most difficult trials that life has to offer. You know, I've, I've counseled with ladies who have lost their husband way before we would say it is time for him to go. Now, all that does is it says, I don't have the say in that. That's God. But I've sat across from ladies as their husband has passed away and said, I don't, I don't know what to do. And I've seen several who have just decided, you know what, I'm going to stay faithful to God. I'm going to stay true to what it, what it is He is because He's ultimately my, my Heavenly Father. And though I miss my husband or miss my spouse like crazy, I'm going to do what I can to stay faithful to God. Because understand this, He'll always be faithful to you. And it is amazing how God uses uh, ladies, gentlemen like that, who will just, in the most, most difficult time in their life, they'll just stay faithful. It's amazing what God will do in their life. Now, I've also seen the other hand, 
where a spouse dies, a family member dies, or, or something is taken away, and that person then becomes bitter and hardened, and they just they begin to wither away because they haven't spent time being faithful to the vine who wants to give them strength, who wants to help them in their time of need. I remember when my own father passed away. I was 20 years old. I didn't know what to do. I remember when, when my dad, he was a, a truck driver and, and worked in the logging industry, was gone. Uh, usually most weekends of the, of the month, he was maybe home one weekend a month and then he'd be out on the road again and driving and, and just making money for his family, which I certainly appreciated and, and uh, uh, benefited from his hard work. But I remember every time, I mean, just like it was clockwork every time. From about the time I was uh, probably eight, nine, ten years old, I remember my dad. Every time he'd walk out the door, the last thing he would do is turn to me and say, Okay, son, you're the man of the house now. You need to take care of mom. You need to take care of your brother. Now, come on. What's an eight-year-old going to do when somebody comes knocking at the door? He's going to go run and hide probably. But when I was 20 and my father passed away, guess what? Son, you're the man of the house now. What are you going to do? Are you going to blame God? Are you going to run away from Him? And quite honestly, at the time, I was not living the Christian life I should be. But what God did is He used that in my life personally to bring Him closer and to bring me back to Him. I didn't plan on being a preacher. Man, my plan was to be a doctor. Make all kinds of money and live on my own and, man, be a bachelor. Well, guess what? My wife's in Oregon right now. I've been a bachelor for a week and it stinks. <laughs> so tired of eating cereal every meal. <laughs> Where am I even going with this? I don't know. Just complaining about my own... I, I needed God in my life to set me straight. To say, son, you need to wake up here. There's some responsibilities that are coming in your life that I want to prepare your, you for. And as I drew more faithfully to my Lord, it was just, quite honestly, I can't think of another word, but, but just fun to watch Him work in my life. Man, it was enjoyable. It was enjoyable to, to go to church and to, to hear God's Word preached and to, to, to have God who, who created the universe speak to my heart. Amen. I didn't understand it. By the way, I still don't. Why? Why, why do you love me enough to speak to my heart? There are bigger things in this world than me. But you understand this, not to him. Amen. Not to him. I remember hearing the song, He Loves Me Like I Was His Only Child. It's a tremendous gospel song, but understand this, it is the absolute truth. He loves you, Christian, like you're his only son, like you're his only daughter. When he purges in your life, he does it because he loves you. And says there's things in, in your life that are drawing you away from me. Your, your attitude is rotten. You, 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 you're prideful. You, you don't spend time with me. You, you put all these other things in, in my place, and I'm telling you, it's not worth it. Those things will not help you like you think that they will. He sees the beginning from the end, and He knows how that road goes when I don't. And so he says, I want to purge those things to keep you disciplined to the vine so that you will grow stronger and now produce greater fruit than you ever thought possible. I don't serve God in my power. When I do, guess what I get? I get my results. But when I serve God in God's power, you know what he does? Far beyond ever I could, whatever I could ask or think. That's where I want to live my life. But the Christian who turns his back on God during the time of purging is the Christian who has another trial just waiting around the bend. Another lesson to be learned. Hold your place in John. Look with me at Romans chapter number 5. Romans 5.
Romans 5, look at verse number 3. Uh, Apostle Paul writes Romans. Had he ever gone through any difficult times in his life? Yeah, a couple. Yeah. Horrible times. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. That's, a, that's an amazing statement. Don't, don't read over that very quickly. He said we, we glory in tribulations also. And look at the very next word. What is it? Knowing, not hoping, not misunderstanding, no, knowing. Well, what do we know? That tribulation, trial, difficult time in your life, tribulation worketh what? Patience. Patience. I need patience and I want it right now. And patience, experience. And experience, hope. <laughs> Going through a difficult time. God's working in me to make patient, make me a patient person. To, to help me to, to trust Him. To, to work on His timing, not mine. Well, guess what happens? When that, that tribulation is over, what do I now have? The Bible says I now have experience. I have a testimony of, hey, I was going through this and God brought me through that and here's how he worked. And now I have an experience. So what comes after the experience according to the Apostle Paul? Hope. That when the next trial comes, when the next difficulty comes, comes I, I look back and I said, well, God got me through that. I guess I can go through another one. God, God worked in that aspect or God, God provided in a way that I never thought he would. I bet he can do the same again. You're absolutely right, he can. Verse 5, and hope maketh not ashamed. See, I'm not ashamed to trust God. He's, he's big enough to take care of me. He's big enough to take care of me. He's big enough to take care of you. Hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Paul was able to praise God in tribulations. Can you do that? when's the last time you've done that? Or do you find yourself, like most of us, mm, can't believe this is going on. Can't wait until this is done. Well, maybe you need patience. Maybe God's trying to do a work in you so that you can be a help to somebody else who's going to be going through that same thing a year from now. And now you've got the experience and the hope to help them go through it. By the way, that's one reason why our older folks in our church, our younger folks ought to be beating down the door to find what can I learn from you? Because they have experience that we don't have. They've gone through things we haven't gone through. And if God brought them through it, do you think he can bring us through it? Yeah, he also brought the Israelites through it when they whined and moaned and complained all the time. And yet God cause their shoes not to wear out, clothes not to wear out. Oh, he's so good and gracious. God was placing patience and hope within Paul through the trial. God was teaching him something that he could have never learned in a Sunday school class, at Bible college, or in a Sunday service. And so this is why Paul can spring up in Romans 1.16 and say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God and salvation. To the Jew first, also to the Greek. I'm not ashamed of what God's done in my life. In fact, I'm proud of it. Praise the Lord for what He's done in my life. God was teaching him that through the burdens come the blessings. Let's look at another example. Look at James 1. James 1. Anybody still in Romans 5? Don't worry about it if you're not. Listen again. Not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Okay, so question. Whose choice is it to glory in tribulations? The person who's going through it, right? Okay, so James 1. Look at verse 2. My brethren... 
Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. All right, stop. Question. Wh whose choice is it to count it all joy? The person going through the tribulation. See, you, the choice is yours on how to respond to that. Verse 3. Man, here's that word again. Only written by somebody else. Now it's James. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let... Okay, stop a second. Question. Who, who can do the letting? The person who's going through the trial. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Question. Is wisdom always knowing what's going on? No. Oftentimes, wisdom is how do I respond when this is going on in my life? Help me to respond better. Help me to count it. Help me to know this. Help me to let it. Do you understand? Hey? Sometimes the reason why we go through trials is to learn how to let it. To understand, to know this. To, to, to count it all joy when you fall into those things. Sometimes people say, well, we seem to be, um, it hasn't happened here. I'm just telling you what can happen. Sometimes people say, well, man, we've been in the same passage. Or we've been in the same section for a long time. Yeah, and you know what the Bible admonition is? To eat. If we're still there, then maybe you need something more. And if God keeps bringing this stuff in your life, maybe you need to learn from it. You need to let it do its work in your life so that you can move on and bear some more fruit. Uh, 1 Peter, one more. 1 Peter. First Peter chapter 1. Look at verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. That's the people that Peter is writing to. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, that is in salvation. Though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Uh, I find that phrase interesting, if need be. Peter is writing to people who are scattered abroad because they're under persecution. And what does he say under inspiration of the Holy Spirit? It must need to happen right now in your life. Verse 7. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory because you did such a good job of getting through it. No. Praise, and honor, and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Wait a minute, they're, they're dispersed. They're, they're out of their homes because of being under persecution. Yeah, but that's not where their joy comes from. What God is doing in their life is teaching them to understand, as you let God work in your life, you can have joy unspeakable and full of glory. So somebody looks at your life and says, I don't understand how you're going through this so well. I don't know how you're handling this in the way that you are. And the only response you can give is, because God is giving me strength to do that. Receiving, verse 9, the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Paul says it. James says it. Peter says it. Jesus says it in John 15, through the burdens, through the purging, through the times of hurt, that's when the blessings come. Do you desire to bear fruit for Christ? Are you, are you willing to endure the present purging to fulfill a greater purpose? So let God's strength get a hold of you. Let God have His perfect work in your life. And to me, that, I mean, that alone, that, that phrase in that verse just captures my attention that the God of all creation, who is all-powerful, to force His will and way on my life. What does He say? 
Let me do this in your life. Give me permission to do it. That, that's amazing. That I can hold God from doing that work in my life just because, and the, the issue why I would hold him back is because I'm a rebel. Because I think my way's better. Third and finally, Jesus says back in John 15, purging facilitates the purification of God's people. Look at verse 3 of John 15. Purging facilitates, it, it, it activates, if you will, the purification of God's people. So the, the vine dresser, the husbandman, is purging away. Now, he says in verse 3, now ye are clean through the what? Word which I have spoken unto you. So the Lord was speaking to these 11 disciples. You remember, he has excused Judas, who had not trusted in him for salvation, who was at this very moment, while Jesus is teaching about abiding in the vine, is bringing the Pharisees and that Roman band into the garden to betray the Savior of all mankind. He's speaking to the eleven, and perhaps as he, he spoke these words, he had this vineyard in view, and he's preparing them for his impending death, his burial, and his resurrection. And at this point in his life, he is very interested in them understanding the importance of being pure or clean, set apart for the task at hand. And so as he's speaking this verse, I, I think he has a couple of different applications here. Number one, they had been cleansed as a group. This group had trusted in Christ for salvation. They had placed their faith in the Messiah. And how were they cleansed? By the Word. Right? Verse number three. You're cleansed by the washing of water of the Word. Right? Paul would say that in 1 Corinthians. God is concerned with their spiritual purity. By the way, that's one reason why he uses the local church and he puts a, an emphasis on the local church being the pillar and ground of the truth because it is one avenue that to, to the best of our ability, we, we try to encourage the purity of the believer in things like what we observed last Sunday evening, the Lord's Supper. Let a man examine himself. Is there anything between you and the Savior? And if so, then make it right before you partake of the elements that picture His body broken and His blood shed. We do things like having a church membership of those who are saved and scripturally baptized. You, you, not just anybody gets to be a member. There are biblical qualifications here. And again, God is saying, I'm concerned about the purity of the, the, the group of you. He desires that we keep short accounts with him, that we regularly confess and forsake sin. Secondly, they had been cleansed individually. Not just as a group, but individually. His word is a cleansing agent. His word is a pruning tool in their life. We, we've read Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12. The word of God is quick. It's alive. Powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces even to dividing asunder a soul and spirit. The joints and marrow is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It enters my life with power to cleanse my life, to purify me before God. Why? Because purging always produces fruit. Getting that stuff out, that, that sin, dealing with that sin brings fruit in my life. So some questions. If you've been running from God and His purging has brought chastisement, turn back to the Lord today. He does it because He loves you. And He wants relationship with you. My dad didn't tell me, stop playing in the street because he didn't like me. He did it because he loved me enough to say, hey dummy, get out of the road. You're going to get hit. And God, in a much kinder way, <laughs> thankfully never... No. Let me get it straight. My dad never called me a dummy, so don't run with that where I didn't put it. But God says, son, daughter, get out of the danger zone. Get, get away from that. Don't go so close to the edge. Get away from the edge. Get as far away from the edge as you possibly can. If God is, is bringing some things about in your life, don't run from Him. Run to Him. Secondly, if God is trying to touch your life now and, and bring you closer to the vine, well, I'm, I'm, the, the Lord is using me and, and I'm grateful for that. Wonderful. 
But if God is trying to get you closer and purge some other things out of your life, then, then do this. Bend willingly. Be moldable, pliable in His hand. Be the clay that hasn't been hardened yet. Be soft clay in God's hand so that He can mold and shape you into what He wants you to be. To use the picture from Jeremiah chapter number 17. We read the verse, 1 Peter 1, 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Christ. If you abide with Christ during times of purging, then one day you're going to be able to praise God and thank Him for the way that He brought you through. James 1, 4, Let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Jesus says it. James says it. Peter says it. Don't run when God is purging. Don't run away from Him. Don't, don't turn away from God and return to old friends or old ways, old lifestyles. Instead, abide faithfully in the vine. Draw closer to Him. No one wants to drink dirty water. So don't live your life in dirty water. Don't, don't live your life full of sin. Or engaged in sin, one hand in sin and one hand in the, in, in the things of God. It doesn't work that way. God wants you to be pure. And so He purges that out of your life. Life's mishaps and tragedies are not a reason to bail out and run from God. They're a time to abide in Him, to abide and wait for greater fruit bearing. When I lived in Oregon, there's a road that goes from our hometown over to the coast. To get to the Oregon coast in a town called Brookings, you either have to go three and a half hours north and go over the mountain, or you can go an hour and a half south, and to go north, you have to go down into California. Brother Mike, you may have remembered this road. You have to go down 199 to 101, and you come into California to go north into, back into the Oregon coast. Well, along that road is a spot where they have, in the coastal mountain range, they have, they've blown a hole right in the middle of the mountain. And they stuck a road right in the middle of that mountain. Well, what naturally occurred is a tunnel. Now, I remember as a kid going through that tunnel, and my dad, when we go through tunnel, he would, uh, number one, tell us to hold our breath. That was probably to shut us up for about, you know, 15 <laughs> seconds while we drove through it. Hold your breath, boys. I need 15 seconds apiece. Or he would uh, honk his horn, you know, and flash the lights and just act like a fool going through this tunnel. I don't know why, but to this day, guess what I do? Hold your breath, we're going through a tunnel, man. <laughs> Flash your lights. Well, we turned on the lights in the tunnel, why? Because it's dark. Do you know that not one time did I fear not making it through the tunnel? Why? Because my dad was driving. He was going to bring me through. I, I knew that eventually we were going to get through, though it was dark, and all of a sudden it was sun, and then it was dark. But I knew at the end of the tunnel, there's going to be light again. Okay, Christian, you go through a tunnel of darkness in your life. Understand this. Your father's driving. He'll bring you through. I didn't complain and try to get out of the car because it was dark. No, I stayed in the car. Why? Because I'm going through the tunnel. I'm going through the difficulty. I'm going through the trial. I'm not going to get off the train and abandon God. I'm going to let Him take me to the end where the sun shines again, where it's bright again, where I'm drawn closer to Him. Are you abiding in Christ even in times of purging? If not, start tonight. Is God doing something in your life and you don't understand why? It's okay. You don't have to understand. Just be faithful to Him. That's what he wants you to do.